We have been looking at the capabilities of Sparkle and many different features of Sparkle. So today it is time to also look at the limits of Sparkle. Of course, like any meaningful technology, um, also Sparkle has its limits, some by design, some maybe coincidentally. And it is important to understand um, what you cannot do with such a technology whenever you want to use it productively. Otherwise, you might uh, spend long times trying to figure out how to, um, for example, create a certain query for a certain problem, when in reality, uh, such a query cannot even exist because it's beyond the possibilities of C query language. Um, so um, welcome back. My name is Markus Krutsch um, and this is the video series on knowledge graphs here at TU Dresden. Right, so before I'm going to talk about um, the actual limits of Sparkle, I would like to mention some things that uh, I simply have left away in these lectures, which are not really limits, but uh, which are uh, actually possible, but out of the scope of this particular uh, video series. So uh, let me give you a brief outlook on Sparkle. So features I have not discussed include um, maybe uh, here focusing on those that are most uh, relevant in practice, um, something that is called graphs. So I was already mentioning when uh, I was discussing RDF that RDF supports um, graphs. So this is an approach for organizing RDF graphs into several distinct data sets, so to speak. So instead of just having one graph in your database, you could have several graphs and each triple belongs to one or more of these graphs. So if you use such a structure, of course, you would like the query language somehow to support that, to have some features that allow you to query only the say, content of one graph or another graph and maybe also to combine information across graphs. And this is supported in Sparkle. There are several um, constructs uh, specifically for this, and there's really no problem with that. Um, well, mostly no problem. Yeah, it, it works quite well in practice. So I'd simply leave this out because we haven't really talked about graphs very much here. Um, the second um, feature that I would like to mention, which is of course very important in uh, query languages, are updates. Updates is something that are often come with query languages. SQL, for example, also has an update language. And this is quite natural because in many cases, when you want to make a change to the database, when you want to write something, um, specifying what you want to do is nicely done by means of a query language that gives you certain parts of the data or that selects certain parts of the data that you would like to change. <clears throat> Here's a little example of how this would be achieved in Sparkle. So uh, the following query replaces all uses of the has sister property with a different encoding of the same information. Now, what's a different encoding? Well, we delete person has sister, sister. So we delete triples of this form. And instead, we insert person has sibling, sister, and sister, sex, female. So this is another way of encoding that somebody is uh, the sister of somebody else. So it's more using the more general and more more widely applicable has sibling property, and in this case, uh, classifying the sister with a gender that, that would somehow capture the original uh, intention of this uh, triple. <clears throat> so we delete uh, and we insert, um, and we do that based on a certain condition, and this is given here in the where part, which says where person has sister, sister. This is in this case, the same condition that we also delete later on, but it could be different. You know, we could delete a pattern which is not exactly what we have been querying for. And without much description of um, updates in uh, any, any formal way here, you can hopefully understand how this is supposed to work. So you select some things giving you bindings to person and sister, then you instantiate a pattern with these bindings. In this case, the pattern is the query pattern and you delete everything that matches this pattern or but rather you delete all the triples that uh, are in this pattern. If they are not there, you uh, just ignore it. And if they are there, you remove them. And after that, you insert new triples again by instantiating this pattern here for every match that you got in the where pattern. <coughs> okay. And in this way, you can update your database and you can update it with one command where uh, you do both the um, deletion and the insertion together so that um, if properly implemented, the database should uh, do this in a certain, in an atomic uh, 
fashion in a sense that uh, a query will either see the state before the change has been made or after the change has been made, but there's no in-between. There's no um, time at which the database does not hold any information about this just uh, because this is done together in one step, so to speak. Yeah. Of course, that's also a challenge for database management systems to properly implement these kind of updates. <clears throat> And uh, one of the big things, of course, that distinguishes a database management system from a system which is merely a query engine that just loads a fixed uh, data set and cannot actually change it or update it. Okay, this is just one example of updates. Of course, Sparkle has more features in stock there, um, which are quite handy and, and nice to use. But you can already guess here from this one example, if you combine this with all the features that you know from the query language with filters, for example, then uh, this is really a very rich language uh, in order to um, manipulate knowledge graphs and to uh, change them in a certain targeted fashion <clears throat> or using queries only without having to write programs to do this. Um, moreover, there's also um, several result formats which we didn't discuss. Uh, in particular, it's also possible to ask queries that return graphs. Uh, this is done with the construct feature. I have not discussed that. And then finally, there are um, federated queries. Um, it is possible uh, for a Sparkle um, endpoint to obtain data from other Sparkle services. Sparkle services that might be um, hosted at a different site even that might be very uh, far away or external at least to the database that you are querying. And it is possible to, to write queries which pull in data from remote places and then combine this data locally with the contents of your database. This is called federation and um, Sparkle has uh, federated query services. In fact, if you have followed the exercises with Wikidata, you have already seen the syntax for this because what Sparkle actually uses there is the service keyword. So the service keyword in Wikidata is also used to um, uh, federate with uh, things that are rather pseudo uh, Sparkle services and not real ones. Um, for example, to connect to web services or other um, service implementations, APIs that you want to use together with Wikidata. So it's used as an extension point there in Wikidata, <coughs> not as a real federation engine. But you can actually also do federated queries with um, the Wikidata uh, Sparkle endpoint um, against a few other uh, websites. Now, uh, an important thing about federation, of course, is that it's a first uh, uh, look at it. It sounds uh, like a great thing. You can combine data from many places into one query, pull data through the from the web from different sources, and then integrate it on your site with your local data to get an answer to do a complex analysis. But of course, the trade-off uh, that you have to face when you do this is that um, you will uh, lose all kinds of database uh, optimizations because of the federation. And normally a database that has all the data locally has index structures on this local data and can prepare the data in certain ways and it can freely choose in which order to uh, query and to combine the query data. But uh, if you have federation, you are much more restricted. You have to get a lot of data from a remote site, even if uh, in the end, um, only few triples will maybe be in the uh, result of your query. Uh, you may have to download millions and millions of uh, result triples from the uh, other place, depending on how uh, the query is specified. So um, federation restricts very much the query optimizer in how it can answer a query and therefore it can be uh, challenging to get a good performance with federation. But it does work and it solves some um, problems uh, in, in practice that uh, otherwise would be much more uh, time consuming to solve but it is not the uh, universal solution to all data integration problems. So there are limitations to this approach. <clears throat> okay, so this is all I want to give in this little outlook. So these are four things from big topics that I haven't uh, discussed here at all. So these are not limitations of Sparkle. But I wanted to talk about limits, so let me talk a bit about limits. I guess you can also guess already what kind of things might be limiting Sparkle. So from your experience with Sparkle, you have maybe already seen some things which are um, not uh, possible in this query language. And uh, maybe you want to think about these a bit to uh, see what limitations you could come up with, what you would like to do maybe in Sparkle and what you think is not possible. <clears throat> 
Well, um, quite a few such limits certainly are there by design and for several reasons, actually. So, for example, Sparkle, of course, is lacking some data types. And maybe more importantly, on the Sparkle side, it's also lacking filter conditions for these data types. I already was mentioning this with RDF. Um, there are a lot of data types in RDF, but not everything can be there. And um, maybe the most notable omission there are geographic coordinates, because um, places in the world are often important in applications, and RDF has no native uh, data type for this. And it can sequentially the Sparkle query language also doesn't have filters, for example, to uh, find nearby coordinates or something like that. Um, most major RDF databases add these features in one way or the other, but they are, the solutions that are adopted there are not part of the standard. So they might be different from database management system to database management system, and it means it uh, somewhat restricts interoperability. If somebody is using um, features that have something to do with uh, geographic information system queries, so just a type of uh, query support, then often they will have to rephrase their queries when they move to another uh, Sparkle uh, processor. It's not uh, very uniform, the kind of support that you get there. But um, for example, in, in Blazecraft, which is used in the Wikidata examples that we have worked with, there is definitely a, a number of um, features in this uh, direction, again, realized through the service keyword, um, which allow you, for example, to look for uh, coordinates that are close to another specified coordinate. So if you want to find um, sites in the vicinity of your home, you could do that with the Sparkle query service uh, using one of such filter conditions. But with, with RDF alone, it would be very difficult to do that. Um, if uh, possible at all. <clears throat> okay, that's uh, data type support. And of course, there are always limits on this side. Um, another thing that you may notice is that Sparkle cannot talk about path length. So we have seen with the Claney star and in the property path expressions, you can talk about uh, patterns that describe connections of arbitrary length. So they describe paths between two elements, but you cannot in any way access the actual length of this path. It is possible to work around some of this. So if you want to have only paths of length three or four, then you could get this by um, writing them out in the query pattern, for example, but it's not a very efficient or convenient way of doing things. And if you wanted to just query about the distance of one element to another in the graph, there would be no way to do this in Sparkle. Um, and in particular, you can also not do something like uh, figure out the shortest uh, connecting path between two elements. And this is a thing that is um, maybe not so frequently used in standard knowledge graph applications. So if you think about Wikidata and you think about the information there, it's rarely important to know how long paths are. Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, longer paths exist, for example, in the um, uh, borders relationship or in, in taxonomic relationships like subclass of, but it's often not very meaningful to ask um, how many subclass of steps two classes are uh, apart, because if we make our class hierarchy more specific, we can always insert extra classes in the middle and it will make all the paths longer without really changing anything about the classes that have already been there. So path lengths are um, more meaningful if you do network analysis, for example, if you are talking about uh, maybe a weighted path analysis could be even more important that you have road networks where you really want to compute the distance between two places in the shortest uh, this connection between them. But um, <clears throat> this already requires a slightly different type of graph structure than what you normally have in RDF. Um, okay, but uh, anyway, it's, it's not included in, in the standard. Um, related to this, Sparkle also cannot return paths of a priori unknown length. So of course, if you know the length of the paths that you want to have, you can somehow return it by having enough variables. But if you just want to uh, have specify, for example, two elements, and you want to know all the ways in which the two elements are connected, there's no um, 
way of doing this. There is not even a return type for this. It's unclear how would you how would you store a path inside a variable binding if it has arbitrary length somehow as a list of things or something. So there is no facility for doing this. Um, <clears throat> and also, well, more generally, maybe Sparkle has no support for recursive or iterative computation. So for example, um, you may have heard of the page rank algorithm. I will also cover it in a later video in this series. Um, which is an algorithm for analyzing networks and uh, link uh, structures in particular. But this is an algorithm which uh, is not, <coughs> uh, it's, it, well, it's relatively e efficient, maybe I should say that, but it's not fast to compute in any sense uh, of the word fast. It's definitely something that takes a while and uh, for a query language would be difficult to realize uh, in real time. Some database management systems for LDF still have added such features, uh, Blaze Graph included. Um, but uh, in practice, uh, this is going to take a significant amount of resources to really compute the page rank for, <clears throat> for uh, a large graph. Uh, and of course, there are many other graph algorithms that one could imagine running on a graph structure, which are not possible to implement in Sparkle because it doesn't have really programming support or recursion support. Again, this is maybe not surprising. It's a query language after all and not a, a full-fledged programming language. There are uh, other approaches for uh, doing programming on graphs. Um, okay, so I already commented a bit on why these things are missing. Um, actually, the reasons in each case might be varied. Uh, there's definitely performance concerns that play a role when people decide what kind of features they include in a language. So they ask, is it even possible to implement this efficiently? If we say this is part of the standards and everybody who wants to be compliant to the standard has to somehow support this and it could uh, place a huge burden on them uh, in uh, getting this into their systems and uh, may uh, in the end hinder adoption of the standard. So this is one motivation why uh, standardization groups try to keep the uh, set of uh, features limited. Um, <clears throat> there's also some fundamental problems with some of these. So for example, if you would uh, be able to uh, compute the length of paths, then you could combine that with filters and would be able to find the longest path maybe uh, between two elements, which is known to be an NP hard problem. And uh, NP, we know, is a, a difficult uh, class of uh, computational problems, um, which still can be solvable in practice. But in this case, it is NP hard in the size of the graph, meaning that it's NP hard in data complexity. And this is a problem because if you think about how large knowledge graphs typically are with hundreds of millions or billions of elements, then you do not want to um, execute computations that are NP hard with respect to this size. Uh, it's not going to work very well. <clears throat> okay, some of these are also merely historic coincidence, like the geographic coordinates. I don't think there's any strong reason why they shouldn't be in RDF or Sparger. It just didn't happen. Um, and uh, in some cases, there would also be bigger design issues if you wanted to solve some of this, especially for returning paths in queries. You would first have to say how to store paths, how to um, represent paths in, the, uh, in Sparkle. And you would maybe need new data structures, new paradigms for this, which don't exist at the moment. Okay, so these are various uh, things that have been left out, but mostly left out consciously uh, because the working group thought that the standard is better without these features, um, even though this will also be a disadvantage in some applications, it will also be an advantage in many others. So there's always this balance, right? Um, uh, so the features I just uh, mentioned are largely features um, that are uh, discrete in a certain sense that they, they really are not present there. So there's clearly there are no geographic coordinates. So there's nothing you can do with geographic coordinates. Uh, end of the story, right? But uh, there's also expressive limits in Sparkle, which concern the things that Sparkle wants to be doing, in particular pattern matching. So there are limitations to the patterns that you can match with Sparkle. Um, even though Sparkle can match many types of patterns with its different conditions and its many features that you have learned about already. So um, how could we understand and uh, get a better insight into the 
expressive limits in this sense of expressivity. Well, this is something that is done largely in uh, computer science and theoretical computer science when studying the expressive power of query languages. What people do there, in not just in RDF, but here I, I phrase it for RDF, but in all kinds of database query languages, is to ask um, which sets of RDF graphs, of databases more generally, can I distinguish using a query of that language? So I'm asking here whether two different RDF graphs can be told apart by means of the features that I have inside a query language. And this uh, is one approach towards the topic of expressivity. What exactly do I mean when I say that? Well, let's be a bit more formal. So um, clearly every query defines a set of RDF graphs, namely the set of graphs that it returns at least one result for. So what we do here is we simplify things a bit by saying we are not really interested in the results. We are just interested in whether there is a result or not. This is a simplification as we often make it in uh, analyzing uh, computer science ideas on a theoretical level, because um, including all the details of uh, practical concern is usually not um, making things clearer and definitely is not making it easier to work with the notion. So what we do here is really very simple. We, in some sense, restrict to Boolean queries. We only want to know yes or no. Are there results or not? <clears throat> and if we do that, of course, every particular Sparkle query will um, split the world of RDF graphs into two types of graphs. The graphs for which there is at least one result and the graph for which there is no result. So um, the, uh, every query in this sense defines one set of RDF graphs. Infinite set, yeah, we could, you could imagine many databases and um, some of these will have results and some of these won't. So this is how you can define uh, a partition of the set of RDF graphs. And uh, so many sets of RDF graphs can be characterized by a suitable Sparkle query. Huh? For example, I could have a query which just asks if the triple ABC is in the database, then all the tr databases which have this triple are in the yes group, and all the databases that do not have this triple are in the no group. Huh? However, not every set of RDF graphs corresponds to a query. So every query will give us one set of RDF graphs for which it will produce answers, but there are many sets of RDF graphs for which um, <clears throat> no query will uh, provide the right behavior. It says here exercise Y. Uh, so this is something to think about. I think we have it in our exercises as well. Uh, as a hint, um, you can already answer this question by just thinking about how many different queries there are and how many different sets of RDF graphs there are. And then you should see that uh, the latter is significantly larger than the former. So it cannot be that they correspond. Okay. Um, I already mentioned this remark here, so whether a query has any result at all is not what we usually ask for, but it helps us here to create a simpler classification. It, we could also compare query results over a graph and obtain similar insights, but it would be a bit more uh, things to explain and describe. <clears throat> okay, now with this idea in mind, with the idea of having um, uh, different classes of RDF graphs characterized by each query, I can now define uh, that um, a query language Q1 is more expressive than another query language Q2 if Q1 can characterize strictly more sets of graphs. So this is a, <coughs> a theoretical approach towards expressivity and uh, we are getting a lot of sun here. I should probably uh, switch back to the slides. It's easier to see. Um, so uh, this is one way to characterize the expressivity of a query language by saying what kind of structures can it distinguish from other structures. Um, and uh, this type of expressivity, of course, intuitively is somewhat related to um, complexity. Yeah? So if answering a query 
takes more computational resources, then um, hopefully it should also uh, be able to tell more complex or, or, to, or to find a bigger amount of uh, interesting classes of RDF graphs. Why is that? Because in order to decide whether a graph is inside or outside of a class, we may have to do some computation. Uh, it may not be easy to uh, do this. So for example, if I um, want to uh, classify um, or I want to define the set of RDF graphs where a resource A is connected to another resource B by an arbitrarily long path, then in order to source this, I need a query language that can compute or can check for arbitrarily long paths in order to make this decision. And we know that checking for paths is of some complexity. It, it requires some computation. And if the query language is not uh, providing for this computational power, then it cannot solve this question and it cannot classify or characterize this particular set. Okay, so higher complexity should have should lead to higher expressivity. But of course, if we say this, we have to be a bit careful. So um, which complexity are we actually talking about here? Right, that's a, a question we should be asking. Um, because we have, of course, studied several types of complexities. We have been talking about query complexity. We have been talking about data complexity and um, combined complexity as the overall complexity. Yeah? So I hope you remember this. This was a discussion we've had with Spark. Now, <clears throat> in this case, uh, here we are, of course, asking um, what do I have to compute on a particular RDF graph? Which kind of computation do I have to uh, perform on a particular RDF graph to find out whether it's a yes graph or a no graph, one graph which is included or one which isn't? And in this form, of course, the complexity we are talking about would be data complexity. Yeah? So given a particular set of RDF graphs that we would like to classify, um, we ask whether there's one fixed query that accomplishes this. So in the end, the computational power we have is always the computational power of a fixed query because this one query has to be able to characterize the whole class of RDF graphs that we are interested in. So with this one query, we have to be able to make the distinction between graphs that are inside the class and graphs that are not inside the class. Uh, so... Um, what this means is that if classifying a set of graphs encodes a computationally difficult problem, then the query evaluation has to be at least as hard as this problem with respect to data complexity. Otherwise, it's not possible. And this shows us already a way how we can find examples of things that you cannot do in Sparkle, because of course there are many very difficult computational problems, and we know that Sparkle has a limited complexity. So here is an example of this. Um, we have argued that Sparkle queries can evaluate quantified Boolean formulae. Uh, you remember these were the propositional logic formulae with um, quantifiers over the truth values in front of them. And we showed that this can be encoded in a Sparkle query. So um, <clears throat> this was possible to solve with Sparkle, where one QBF turned into one query. However, you could also imagine that you can encode such a formula, such a QBF, inside an RDF graph. graph. So there's many reasonable ways of doing this, but in general, encoding a formula inside a graph is not very difficult. A formula is a term structure. It has some kind of hierarchical structure. You can make a graph out of this, and then this is your graph. Yeah? So imagine now we would like to um, find a query that recognizes exactly those RDF graphs which encode a QBF that evaluates to true. And uh, what you can see now is that this is not going to be possible. So there cannot be a Sparkle query that recognizes all RDF graphs that encode a true QBF because this problem finding out whether a QBF is true is known to be P-space complete. That's what we learned when we talked about Sparkle. But um, <clears throat> P-space is a very large complexity class, and it is known that this co complexity class is uh, strictly larger than NL. And NL is the data complexity of Sparkle, of course. Yeah? So in this way, by knowing that this data complexity of Sparkle is only NL, we can already exclude that any Sparkle query could solve this highly complicated problem. And you can imagine many other 
complicated problems uh, which you cannot solve with Sparkle in this way. Uh, so uh, computer science and, and many computer science courses that you hear about are full of difficult problems. And uh, for many of these problems, it would easily be possible to find an RDF graph that encodes them, but then you couldn't find a Sparkle query that um, returns yes or no, depending on what the answer to this problem should be. Yeah. Okay. So this is something that follows from purely complexity theoretic um, knowledge. I just summed up things that we already know essentially here. I didn't have to do any new work to understand this. Um, so this is a limit of expressivity, but arguably it's an argument that is in itself very limited. So we don't get very far by this type of uh, argumentation. Um, and this has several reasons. For one reason is that this kind of complexity argument only works if you have significantly harder problems. So QBF uh, solving, yes, this is very hard. And uh, so it's clear that this cannot be done. But there are many interesting problems which are not quite so hard and which also cannot be done. And you won't find good arguments. If the problem you are looking at is less complex, then it could also be that um, you need additional assumptions to uh, achieve uh, the uh, claim or to show the claim that you would like to show. So um, the assumption in this case is that uh, you many of the uh, complexity classes that we are handling are, of course, uh, not known to be distinct. So we have um, uh, no knowledge, for example, about whether NL and NP are the same class or not. We don't think they are. It seems very unlikely, but nobody has been proving it yet. So if we have an NP problem, such as um, uh, finding out if a certain traveling salesman problem is uh, uh, solvable, um, <clears throat> we expect that Sparkle cannot solve this, but it's not quite a proof that it isn't possible by just using it, uh, using complexity here. And um, of course, one thing that we also have to see or which we will learn is that um, it's quite typical that query languages cannot even solve all the problems which are within their own complexity class. So for example, in a case of Sparkle, there are NL problems which Sparkle cannot solve, even though they are of the same complexity class. So in this case, complexity arguments will never help us to see the difference. Um, so it's better to have some direct arguments for why something is not expressible. And these can also be found. OK, now let me give you an example that illustrates what I just claimed, namely that expressivity and complexity are not the same, that there are things of the same complexity which are still not expressible in Sparkle. And uh, as an example here, I give a, a very simple problem, which I call parallel reachability. It's not a standard problem like reachability, so don't expect that you can do a web search for this name and find the same th uh, things. I just called it parallel reachability because I think it's intuitive. So this problem is um, consisting of the following question. You have an RDF graph G and two vertices S and T, and you have two RDF properties P and Q. All of this is your input. And the question then is whether there is a directed path from S to T where each two neighboring nodes on the path are connected by both a p edge and a q edge. I hope you can imagine how this looks. So we are looking again for paths here from source to target, just like in the reachability case. But the goal now is not just to find any path of a single edge going through many intermediate nodes until we are at the target, but we are trying to find a path which consists of two parallel edges in each of its segments. So there always has to be a P edge and a Q edge connecting the same two nodes to go one step on this path. So this is a parallel reachability problem. Essentially, we just have a different requirement on what happens in each step of the path, but otherwise it's still an arbitrarily long path. Now, um, this problem is not very difficult to solve. It's still actually as difficult as reachability was. We, we remember source target reachability we discussed before. Um, this was an NL problem, non-deterministic log, log space 
uh, algorithms exist, which means you can uh, solve this with very little memory if you guess your way around. Um, the idea is very simple. It's proof sketch essentially here. This is the check can be done using a similar algorithm as for ST reachability, but we just check for two edges in each step. So essentially, what we did there we, was we blindly guessed the next uh, step in the path. Okay. So it's possible and it's not harder than reachability. However, I claim and I sketch a bit that this is not possible in Sparkle. There's no Sparkle query that solves parallel reachability. Um, so Sparkle cannot express this. You cannot check if there is such a connection of arbitrary length, even though it's a problem in NL. Um, now, how could we show this? How could we prove such a thing? Well, it, the idea could be to look at structural properties of Sparkle query matches to see what is different with these parallel paths of arbitrary lengths um, from all the other kinds of matches that you could get for, for Sparkle queries. And um, I would argue that one way of seeing this, I'm only going to give you a sketch here, so this is not a full formal proof, but essentially it's going to be a sketch. Um, so I think one way of seeing this is that, uh, first of all, we say that the only Sparkle feature that is even in scope for looking at this are property path patterns, because these are the only, this is the only feature that can look at arbitrarily long paths. So we somehow need a Claney star in order to make such an, ex as, to express such a uh, requirement here. <clears throat> However, um, the a property path pattern will always uh, have a match. If it has a match at all, then it also has a match where um, you have only two vertices, uh, where, where all the vertices that are on the path that you match have degree two. Yes. So in the end, if you have um, vertices on a path, the path, of course, is very linear. So the, the nodes on this path only have two neighbors, one incoming, one outgoing. This is how matches for property path patterns look. And um, this can be arbitrarily long, but the uh, degree of the nodes on this match are, is always two. Um, but here in this problem with the parallel reachability, we need nodes of degree higher than two because every node on the path has two incoming edges and two outgoing edges with the P and the Q in parallel. How can higher uh, degree nodes be produced in a uh, Sparkle match as well? Uh, the problem is that higher degrees essentially can only be enforced for nodes that are matched to query variables. That's the only place. So if you have a variable in a query, of course, it can partake in any number of triple patterns, and this will require its, its, its degree to be higher. But um, this is only true for the variables. So what I'm arguing here is that whenever you have a basic graph pattern with property path uh, patterns inside, um, then it, and it has a match at all in some situations, then it will have a match that uh, where the only, uh, in a graph where the only vertices that have a degree higher than two are those vertices that have been mapped uh, to, that the variables have been mapped to. Yeah. And these are always a finite and fixed number depending on your um, basic graph pattern. And because of this, we can now see roughly that um, there cannot be an arbitrarily long parallel path match because if such a match would exist, it would require that you have an arbitrarily large number of um, nodes with higher degrees required inside of a graph in order to be a match in the first place. And it's with basic graph patterns and property path patterns together, it's not hard to see that this is not possible. You cannot require that uh, such a high number of high degree vertices exists in the graph in the first place. Yeah. So this is the argument. And of course, this is still sketchy in some ways. It's also sketchy because it only focuses on basic graph patterns. I'm not really making much of an argument why you couldn't somehow use other features of Sparkle to achieve that. This uh, I just expect is easy to see. Um, 
So uh, we can accept that maybe, but I think uh, still this the important trick here is to look at um, this degree distribution of uh, matches and to look at minimal matches for a given pattern. Okay, All right. So this is the, the type of proofs one could give here to establish such a result. Right, so um, in similar fashions, uh, in a similar fashion to what we just saw with parallel reachabilities, there are quite a number of other patterns that Sparker cannot capture. Um, I have a little slide which lists some of these, so you can see them here. Um, <clears throat> in general, the restrictions come from the fact that the only form of recursion that you have in Sparkle are property path patterns, which are regular expressions. Um, so. For one thing, you cannot map, map, map uh, non-regular path languages. Um, what is a non-regular language? Well, do you know a non-regular language? For example, um, <clears throat> a context-free language like uh, A to the N, B to the N. Yeah? So if you have a sequence, an arbitrarily long sequence of A's followed by a sequence of B's, which is of exactly the same length, this is something that uh, it says the language of all these sequences is not a regular language. You cannot express it in any property path pattern. Um, you don't need it very often in uh, querying either. I mean, arguably, this is maybe not a problem if you don't have that. But there are some applications for this. So, for example, if you wanted to find all your cousins, uh, and I don't mean all your first degree cousins, but all your cousins, essentially. So everybody in your family who is in your generation. Uh, then this uh, means that you have to go, oh, oh, well, it's not quite everybody who is in your uh, uh, generation because this includes your siblings, but uh, to go to, to get your cousins, you have to go up to your ancestors, maybe to your parents, find their siblings and go back down to uh, their children. And of course, you have to go the same number of steps up that you want to go down. And this is why this is not a regular language. Yeah. So if you wanted to ask uh, for a give a query in Sparkle that finds cousins of arbitrary degrees, this would not be possible with uh, the uh, patterns that we have there. Um, other uh, uh, things can also not be expressed, uh, even if they have regular um, patterns underlying. For example, uh, what I write here is white paths consisting of repeated patterns that uh, you have to chain together. Actually, the parallel reachability is already an example of this. So you can imagine the parallel reachability, the pattern there is just um, two nodes connected by P and by Q. This is the pattern. And now you repeat this pattern many, many times and you construct reachability over it. This is something that cannot be expressed, but you could also do that for any other pattern. For example, take a little square with four properties uh, or four triples being arranged in a like in a square and you would now chain them one after the other so that you find a path which looks like a ladder yeah so this is also something that you couldn't express in sparkle there's no way of doing this type of thing tree-like patterns and other non-linear patterns so uh, find all the roots of a tree where all the all the uh, um, uh, where we are, which are full binary trees, maybe I should say. Uh, so find the roots of full binary trees where you have two properties where which marks the left and the right child. Um, uh, this uh, would be problematic. It's a recursive uh, query that you that requires recursion, but uh, inside the recursion there is uh, some branching happening because the tree has several successors. So we are not just talking about paths here, and this would not be possible. And then there's also something which I mentioned here um, because it has been studied in other query languages. These are so-called nested regular expressions. Um, essentially, the idea with nested regular expressions is that you have a path a regular path query like the ones we have studied. But in each step of the path, you can also specify side conditions that have to hold about the elements there. Uh, we have had an example uh, of such expressions in some of our exercises. If you want to find um, ancestors of somebody uh, such that everybody who <coughs> on the path to this ancestor has played an instrument. And then you have a certain side condition on the things that you can go through in the path. And this can be expressed by nesting these conditions inside the regular expressions called nested regular expressions. Um, so these kind of 
queries uh, have been studied in XML and uh, in these kind of uh, tree-based document structures, they can be quite useful. So if you want to navigate to a certain node and want to make sure that all the nodes that you pass through have a certain quality, uh, then this is something you can achieve with nested regular expressions. <clears throat> okay, so all of this uh, is are examples of things that you cannot express. There are more, of course. Um, and what we see here, what we've learned uh, now in this video, I'm at the end of the video at this point. So what, what we've learned in this video is that um, when we talk about the limits of a, of a query language, there are two different, very distinct kinds of limits that we can look at. So one limit is um, the limitation in terms of features that people have built into the query language, like technical features, um, formats, data types, such things, return formats that you have. And the other kind of limit is um, the expressivity limit, uh, which somehow uh, restricts what we can describe, what kind of patterns we can describe, what kind of structures we can find in a graph. And I would say the latter is generally more interesting. The former is uh, something that can easily be um, fixed. The latter often is not so obvious. So if you wanted to have support for um, nested regular expressions, you would have to think how to how to write this in Sparkle. You can't just um, make a new feature and like for geographic coordinates and be done with it. Um, so uh, these are interesting uh, distinctions and interesting matters of study. On the other hand, in practice, arguably the features are often the more important things. Yes. So if you are in an application, often you say, I want geographic coordinates. You don't necessarily say, I want um, to have parallel reachability queries yeah? because there's usually ways around this. In, in the case of parallel reachability, for example, you could think of something. If you um, uh, take uh, the uh, parallel paths P and Q that I was talking about and you just make an update to your database, which inserts for every parallel PQ path uh, an extra triple, which uh, marks this uh, the pair as a connected pair as a pair which is connected by a parallel PQ path then you can use Sparkle uh, reachability in the normal way to uh, find such paths. So sometimes expressivity problems can be solved by making changes to your database, by making changes in how you encode your data and how you store your knowledge in the first place. So um, in some ways they can be prevented in practice if you are uh, mindful about your requirements and uh, make sure that your data already comes in the format that you need it to in order to um, get along with the features that Sparkle has to offer as it is. Okay, um, so this, this is all for this rather long video again. So um, thank you for watching. Next time I would like to uh, take one or two videos uh, or maybe three, uh, a little look at um, rule-based query languages, which um, can uh, overcome some of the expressivity limits uh, in particular that relate to structural uh, recursive expressivity. Um, and after that, we will look at uh, property graphs and cipher as a, another practical query language that is uh, of wide uh, interest. So um, thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.